Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, all are one to one. I'm delighted the writer Kelly Corrigan can join us today. And when you hear her story, I'm sure you will be too. She's the author of The Middle Place, published by the voice imprint of Hyperion Books. I think we'll learn about ourselves from Kelly's story about discovering what it means to be both parent as well as daughter, especially during difficult times. Welcome. Thanks, it's great to be here. So why did you write this book? Well, I initially started writing the book because I thought that my father was gonna die. Um, he was 78 and he had, had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and had sort of a messy, complicated case in 93. And then it was 2004 and he had been diagnosed with a complicated case of bladder cancer, which was made more complicated by the fact that he no longer had a prostate. And so there was scar tissue issues and et cetera. The point is that it was a, it was a challenging case and the prognosis was not good. And I um, might be one of the few writers to have come from a really happy childhood. And my father... Oh, one of two. Probably yeah. One of two. <laughs> my father um, is just a great believer in people, including me, and um, used to always say that I was going to write a great book someday. And so I had all this kind of manic energy around him and, and his illness, and um, I just couldn't fill the hours. So I made a lot of phone calls to doctors. I looked up stuff on the internet about bladder cancer, and then with the 23 hours that were left in the day, I started banging out uh, words on my computer in my office. And uh, I just wanted to write the stories of my childhood, and I wanted to write them for him and for me and for and my kids. And for him kids. to be able to read? Be yeah, so it had, there was a certain urgency to the project mm -hmm. that hadn't been there before because I had tried to write. I was an English major in college, and I wrote during college, and I went. I was a uh, master's in English literature from San Francisco State, which I got at night in my late 20s, and I tried to write before, um, but it's, you know, one of those things that you can just put off forever. Right. And this, suddenly, there was this urgent need to get it on paper, and um, although he's easily impressed, I, I did want to kind of wow him, and as I was writing, I was thinking about how neat it would be for my brothers to have it, too, for, for them and their children, and um, so that's what got me going. That's what got me off the dime. Now, you read a lot about uh, particularly with baby boomers, I guess, about the sandwich generation, mm -hmm. people who find themselves both taking care of their own children and having to take care of elderly parents at the same time. Is that what you meant by the middle place, or is it something different? Um, well, in kind of a literal way, what I meant was that I have sort of one foot in parenthood and one foot still firmly in my childhood. And so I pictured it sort of like a Venn diagram where here's my childhood and here's my parenthood. And then there's this little sliver of time where those two things overlap. Um, but the sandwich generation has all this negative, um, has a negative connotation. That's and true. For me, the middle place, it's, it's not, I, I'm not exhausted by it. It's not about how I'm, you know, I got my kids asking for one thing on one hand and my father asking for another in thing the on the other hand. Home, and, right, yeah, right. and I'm just completely wiped out. I don't know who to give my attention to. I don't feel that way at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, it's kind of an abundant time and a time um, of great insight for me. Um, I mean, I think everyone can relate to the fact, um, the idea of seeing your childhood differently when you become a parent. So all the things that your parents did that at the time seemed uh, random or cruel um, or unnecessary now as a parent, I find that I'm sort of doing those very same things. And so I feel lucky to be in the middle place. I feel lucky that my parents are still here while I'm growing into my role as a mother so that I can go back to them and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was so awful. And I just didn't understand. I had no uh -huh. idea how much you loved me and I didn't know how, for how long. Do you see a correlation between being a good daughter and being a good mother? That's an interesting question. Um, well, I think, I think for sure that um, you become a better daughter as you're becoming a better mother. So that's the correlation for me, is that the, the, the deeper I get into this, the you more... You become chastened by your own experience. And forgiving. Yes. Um, and everything is very um, 
it seems very reasonable now all of a sudden that they would have these crazy curfews. For instance, my daughter just asked me for an iPod and she's six. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her with exactly the same face that my mother looked at me when I said I wanted guest jeans. Just like, absolutely not. I don't care how many times you ask me, I don't care how many ways. You're six years old, you don't need an iPod. And but your mother caved. She caved, she did cave. After, after about three months, she caved. And it was, you know, she sort of used it as my Christmas present. So only time will tell. That's right. Say. <laughs> well, I think once, when George is old enough, I hope she's not watching this, but eventually I will get her an iPod when I think that she's old enough to take care of it mm -hmm. and really appreciate it. At the moment, she's saving for it, but she has about $5, and I keep explaining to her. What does an iPod cost? Well, the one she wants costs like $120. Okay. So okay. at that rate, I think she'll be 11 by the time <laughs> she has an iPod. You seem to have grown up in an extremely loving and unusually functional family. Tell us about your family growing up. But it was like growing um, up in that family. Well, I think that things, and you really, you really understand your family in a different way once you get married too, because then you're sort of comparing notes about how they did it in your husband's house versus your house. And what I think is different about our house is that um, we were, everyone was permitted to fight and blow off steam. Um, you were not permitted to um, be unforgiving. So it was totally okay to get into a knockdown drag out, but it had to end. And you had to come back together and you had to give each other a hug and you had to shake hands and you had to say, it's over, it's no big deal. And I think that that, um, I think that's a nice, that works for me. That's a nice way to live. I think there are other households where, you know, there's so, there's such a um, premium put on harmony and keeping the peace and nobody raising their voice that, you know, you come, you come out of the, 18 years later, you come out the other side, you know, and you got a lot of stuff built up that's never seen the light of day. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was one thing that went right in our house. I think that, um, my parents are Catholic, and they always say that the eleventh commandment is, um, "Thou shalt laugh at yourself, thyself." Um, so I think that uh, nobody was permitted to take themselves too seriously, um, and there was a lot of um, taking each other down with humor. Um, like no one's ever gained five pounds in our house without being told that they've gained five pounds uh -huh. five different ways, and um, you know we all have watched my Amazon sales rank go up and go down and every time it goes down they send me emails and say oh Kel it was a good run so, <laughs> good luck kid um, so th there's a lot of good humor now the dominant figure in all of this was your father yeah who you call who was called Greeny where yeah. did that come from uh, his brothers named him Greeny a oh long okay time ago. tell us about you had a very special relationship you have a special relationship with him but certainly growing up you did. yeah I think that um, the remarkable thing about my dad, I mean, there are many remarkable things about my dad. My dad is one of those people that whenever anybody finds out that I'm related to, to, that, to him, they come running over and say, are you, you are George Corrigan's daughter? Like, what a guy. Um, he's just sort of generally positive. He comes from a place of terrific gratitude, but it's all very natural. It's not, it's not that he, he, I don't think he's achieved it, which I think would be even more impressive. Mm -hmm. I think if you had sort of uh, a half empty disposition and you, and you talked yourself into being an optimist, that would be really something. I think he was just born this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand from his brothers and sisters that, you know, as a five-year-old, you know, they, they would complain about how they were all stuffed in the car and he would find the silver lining in it. Um, but as a parent, the thing that, that's so interesting about him is that um, he was so interested in us. I mean, he was so taken with us. You know, he's really enamored with the stuff that we would do, and we weren't doing anything that great. I mean, not, the three of us, we didn't go to great colleges. We weren't terrific students. My brothers were really good athletes, but not like, you know, the top of the top. Right, right. Um, but, you know, me, if I made like a little collage out of his old magazines, he just couldn't get over it. La vie, this is phenomenal. Look at this thing. <laughs> Mary, you got to see this. You know, and then I turned this hall closet into my office, you know, behind the coats, and I put paper all over the walls, and I made a logo for my club, and I had this teeny desk. And, you know, every time someone came over, he said, you got to see this. You got to see Kelly's office. It probably helps you not to have so self-esteem problems when you have father like that. I think so. I think so. I mean, I think that your parents sort of define you first, and you either end up adopting their vision of you or railing against their mm -hmm. vision of you. And he, you know, in, in my case, he really sees me as I would like to be seen. Now, how about your mother? She was a different personality. Totally different. Um, equally confident. 
um, equally on the job. So they both took it seriously. They both took parenting seriously, and it was the you know sort of the central the central work of their life. It wasn't we were never second to something else. Now they were very religious. They um, are uh, religious but, is such a funny way of putting it. They they're very Catholic. Right. <laughs> now this is not difference. something. I, my sense is that this is not something that that you are that you not I'm carry not, that into your. I'm not, but I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not going to become. I mean, I really hope. I really hope to find something that approximates what they have. I mean, they go to church every day. Was that an issue? Did they cause any rifts? That they were very Catholic? No, and they're, still hoping. they're still they're hoping. Still, <laughs> they're still hoping. They haven't. That's given why up. they're going to church every day. They go to church they're every day. Oh God! You. They pray for me. My mom has a rosary underneath her pillow. Yeah, and they take my kids to church. Mm-hmm. And you know, we got married in a Catholic church and we baptized our kids Catholic. Right. Um, and now we're at this point where Georgia is probably a year away from getting her first communion. And so I feel like we need to come to some kind of, I wrote an essay for O Magazine about this for the May issue about faith and this point in my life where I'm wondering if I'm handicapping my children. You know, by not by, raising them. By not giving them some sense of something larger. Mm -hmm. And yet you moved all the way across the country to away from your family, yeah. Um, despite well, this bond you have with them, yeah, I know. And you never know how long you're going when you leave. You know, like I, I didn't know I was 25, so I didn't have the the vision to say that I would have been there 16 years later. I'd still be there and be married and a homeowner. Um, and also, the Bay Area is just so painfully expensive that I just felt like whenever the time came to stop renting, that's when we would go home. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the interesting thing about moving all the way across the country, which sort of led to the middle places, um, I had, that gave me this false sense of independence. Like, well, I must be pretty grown up if, I've living, if I'm living this far away. But the truth is, you know, I, I, I always was still thinking of myself as George Corrigan's daughter mm -hmm. and, not, and not really as this George's mother, you know, or Claire's mother. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back in a moment. Any questions? No. You know. We're not magicians. We can't read your mind. We need your, mind. We need your questions, each and every kind. Where well, this react with my other medicine? Hey, what are all these tests even for? Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. I'm talking with Kelly Corrigan, author of The Middle Place. Now, three years ago, you discovered this lump in your breast, which turned out to be pretty advanced breast cancer. Mm -hmm. How did that change your life, the family dynamic with your new family and your, and your old family? Well, that was really the... Um the most revealing moment for me, which is to say that I, you know, I was 36, I had two kids, a husband, a mortgage, tax returns, the whole deal. And I, as you said, I was living far from home. And so I really had it in my head that I was a grown up. And then I got this diagnosis and it was a big tumor. It was seven centimeters by five and a half centimeters. So it's bigger than a golf ball. And um, it was a fast growing tumor. It had, it wasn't there 12 weeks before. So it went from nothing to like this big in 12 weeks. Um, and it was stage three, which was startling to me. And I called home and they came. And the experience- Right, right away, right away? Right away. Uh huh. And the experience of being sick, I, I found to be a very childlike experience. You know, you should have been coddled and cared for and people are, doing things for you again, which as a young mo a mother with young children, it had been a long time since someone made my bed for me or did the laundry in my house or took my kids to school. And all of a sudden, I was the one who everyone was worrying about. Um, and I was the one who was taking naps and I was the one that people were cooking for. Mm -hmm. And um, it felt really good. And I felt really safe again. Uh huh. And then right on the heels of it, after I had to do eight rounds of chemo, and after my seventh chemo, uh, my parents called and said, your father just got diagnosed, and I'm so sorry, but we can't come for Christmas, and 
you know, he's going to, we don't know what kind of treatment he's going to need to do, and it's sort of a complicated case. And and, um, and did they tell you that right away? My, I thought that they had held it, withheld that information from you for a while or not. Well, they, they had withheld it twice before. Okay. So when my father had prostate cancer, I was traveling, and they didn't tell me until I got home. Mm -hmm. And that, and his prostate cancer was months and months long, and uh, so I was gone for quite a while. And then um, they, he had a small treatable case of bladder cancer a year before, which they never mentioned to me or my brothers, which is what parents do, right? Right. It's just protecting, trying but to protect the their kids. it's the third occurrence and the most. And the third so, occurrence and the most complicated right. and the kind of grimmest prognosis. That you, that you heard about when you have cancer, when you're being treated for cancer yourself. Didn't have a hair on my body. Really? Literally. Not an eyebrow, not an eyelash. Mm -hmm. Everything's gone. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I was sitting on the side of my sofa with the phone in one hand, and my father-in-law was in the kitchen, and he had just handed me a glass of wine, and I just, my impulse was just to throw the wine against the wall. Like, I just couldn't stand it. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't feel that way when I got sick. I didn't feel outrage. I didn't feel anger. I felt like something's going to happen to me. Like, I am a pad of good. I have two parents. They love each other. They're healthy. I got pregnant without too much trouble. Right. My kids are healthy. I found a nice guy to get married to. Like, I, I mean, I, I was waiting for the shoe to drop. And so when the diagnosis came through, I sort of felt like, okay, fair enough. You know, I've been, it's been 36 years without an ounce of trouble, so here it is. But then when my, you know, three or four months later when my father called, that was a, a moment where I felt furious and so totally like out of control. Pushing you over the edge. I, I just of. couldn't take, you know, you, you, you feel, there are certain people in the world that make you feel bulletproof. Right. And he's my, he's one of my people. So how did you work through that? I wrote, and I, I was, I, I, on, when I wasn't writing, I was making a complete nuisance out of myself. I mean, I was, you know, everybody plays a different role in a family when somebody gets sick, and especially when there are decisions to be made. Right. You know, his case, my case was so cut and dry, there were no choices. And you became Kelly Corrigan, MD. Oh, it was so embarrassing. So my brother, at one point, when I was just at the peak of my, um, you know, kind of panicked, know-it-all, obnoxious state, um, said, now let me just ask you, which medical school did you go to? Because I can't remember. Did I miss mm -hmm. your graduation? Mm -hmm. um, and it did make me laugh, which was such a relief because I really needed a good laugh at that point. Now, your uh, husband was pretty great throughout all of this. Yeah, he really was. He really was. He handled it well. Did you marry your father? No. No, I really didn't. Um, I married a guy who is... Um, He's not reserved, but relative to my father. I mean, he's not nearly as effusive as my father. He doesn't give it up as easy. Um, like, I remember when I was writing this, uh, The Middle Place, I would hand him chapters. And if I had handed it to my dad, almost no matter what was on the page, he would have said, Lobby, fantastic. And Edward would read it and say, I don't think there's anything in this chapter worth keeping. <laughs> 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 and I, at first, I sort of was craving, like, some accolades and a pat on the back. You know, that was my, that's what I was used to. Mm -hmm. But that, now I've really come to value that. I mean, I feel, you know, I felt when The Middle Place came out, I felt so safe because I knew that it had passed muster with Edward. Right. And I knew that he wouldn't let me make a fool out of myself. Right. Um, and he's much smarter than I am, so mm -hmm. it, that, that was also a big safety net. Both your father, being sick at the same time. You and yeah. your father. How did that affect your relationship? Did it change it in any way? No, it really didn't. It's funny. I, I mean, you would think it would, but we were really, we're just solid. You know, we were solid already, and so it was a little bit of bonding. Um, did he tend to minimize what was going on with himself? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Drove me crazy. I mean, when he, for instance, and he does all the time. So my mom said that the kind of the worst moment in her life before I got diagnosed was that my dad had had surgery on his prostate and there was problems with the surgery and um, he had urine escaping into his system and it was giving him this incredibly high fever. But they didn't know any of that. All they knew was that he was having these fevers. So he called my mom on the way down Wooded Lane, to, way home to Wooded Lane and said, uh, uh, Mayor, do you need me to grab something for you at the store? I'm on my way home. And she said, no, you don't sound right. And he said, ah, I'm a little bit hot came in the back door and collapsed in her arms. Mm. He had like 104 fever. Wow. And he was just going to zip over to the Acme and grab some green beans on the way home for my mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, she said, I was like, George, take this seriously. So when he was sick with uh, bladder cancer this, t this time, when I was sick, I felt very bossy. 
Like, I don't trust you to take care right. of yourself. Like, right. you're my father. I need you in the world. Like, I'm going to tell you what to do. You keep taking that Coumadin. You drink your water. Don't play squash. I mean, he was trying to change. He actually tried to change his chemotherapy appointment so that he could coach a lacrosse game. This uh -huh. was a big game. I said, Greeny, you can't change your chemotherapy appointment. Like, this is, this is the real deal, my right. friend. And I mean, I'm not trying to bring you down, but this is the real deal. Mm -hmm. Wooded Lane. Boy, what a name. That's sort of like Dorothy being, you know, Kansas. Yeah, from yeah. Kansas. <laughs> Wooded Lane. The term survivor is used, seems to be used only by cancer patients, not by people with other illnesses. Why is that? And is that appropriate? I have no idea. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. I've never noticed that, but of course it's true. Uh, I don't know why other people don't use it, and it's not how I think of myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't really, um, the whole cancer thing was like a weird dream now. I mean, it's so far away from me, I, I can't even get back there. Mm -hmm. I, the only time I get back there is like the five to seven days before my next mammogram. And then I'm like kind of electric with fear again. Right. And then I get the mammogram, and I'm sitting in the, in the robe in the, in the little waiting room, and I'm, you know, like my palms are sweating. And then they come out and they say, Kelly, you can go. Mm -hmm. Everything looks good. And then I go back into my, it's like swimming up, you know, and getting to the surface mm -hmm. and just living on the surface and then, you know, getting plunged underwater again. How has being Greenie's daughter affected your ability to cope with this scary disease? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I think that I emulate my dad a lot. But as I said, it really, his, his nature is such that this is, you know, he's just doing what comes naturally to him. Whereas my nature is different, and sometimes I just fake it to make it. You know, sometimes I just play Greenie's daughter in order to sort of get there. So, for instance, when I first got diagnosed, I sent out a big email to probably 100 people, and I said, uh, I just want you to mark your calendars. We're going to have a huge party a year from now. In the meantime, I'm going to go through chemotherapy. I'm going to go through surgery. I'm going to go through radiation. And I actually had a reader ask me, like, how did you... Why were you so positive? I had breast cancer, and I just sobbed for a week. And I said, oh, I think I was kind of faking it to make it. You know, I think I was pretending like I was optimistic in the hopes that if I put that out there, that it would come back to me and sort of, you know, sink in a little bit. Did and it? I would actually Did start it? to feel. What really made me optimistic was that it was evident after two chemos that the chemo was working. Okay. So Did I was sort of on pins and needles for about six weeks. And then after, when I was going into my third chemotherapy, which would have been six weeks after I got diagnosed, um, the nurse said, oh, it's definitely softer. Mm -hmm. I can feel it right. changing. So then it was like, I'm not a corner case. What's life like post-cancer? Uh, you know, it, the, the, um, the book has changed my life more than cancer changed my life. Um, you know, people say, oh, it was cancer just a huge wake-up call. But I didn't, I mean, I'm not saying this with any pride, but I didn't need a wake-up call. I mean, it took me a long time to find my husband. I was really anxious about, um, you know, sort of not, not finding my guy. And so it's never been lost on me that I got the thing that I really wanted. And although I'm a feminist, I'm not afraid to say that also the other thing, I mean, my dream of dreams was to have children. Right. So my dream came true. And... Uh, so that's the sort of focus of my life. But this book has changed things. I have to say this is the most cheerful cancer book that I've yeah. read. Yeah. And when I hope that the, the, the cancer pieces are really real and people always say that they get the chills or they, it makes them cry, you know, and women have said, you totally horrified me. I was on, at the gym on the Stairmaster crying or I was on the bus crying. Or, um, but then there's a lot of comic relief because the, every other chapter is this backstory from my childhood mm -hmm. and there's just so much good uh, good fodder from my childhood. So how's your father doing? He's great. He's uh -huh. totally great. Yeah. Uh, is great. he still being treated for his third cancer? Is that over or what? It's over. He had um, 60 sessions of um, oh, what's it called? oxygen treatments. Um, uh, it starts with a B. I can't remember what it's called. At any rate, he did uh, two, 60 two-hour sessions in like an oxygen tank. It sort of mm -hmm. looks like a um, tanning bed. Right. And that's what helped him stop bleeding. So okay. he was just bleeding, um, you know, through, through his bladder for probably six months. He probably went to the emergency room every week for six months. Really? Um, and he's finally stopped um, and it's finally healed. What do you want readers to come away with from this book? Well, I want them to have a good time. 
I mean, I want, I want them to smile when they close it. Um, I, I hope that it gives people room to think about what it is to still have parents in the world um, and sort of get them to relish that as much as they can before it's over. Um, you know, and I, and I think it's giving people, I mean, at least from what I can tell from emails and reviews and stuff, it's putting a name on something that used to not have a name. So the middle, the middle place, place is really, people are really glomming on to that as like a, a thing now. And I think it is helping people find words um, for something that they're experiencing anyway. Well, I'm very happy to hear that your father's doing well and that you're doing well. Thanks. And I enjoyed your book. Thanks. We're out of time. Uh, Kelly Corrigan's book, The Middle Place, has just been published by the voice imprint of Hyperion Books. My best to you and your family. Thank you so much. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.